Okay, many of you probably know New Zealand as a Lord of the Rings country. We have plenty of wind, we have plenty of beautiful water, and we have plenty of sunshine. The issue for us is how to actually manage it appropriately. So do you think we can do it, or are we going to have to call on Legolas to help <laughs> us out of this mess? A bit about my own background, I was brought up in a place very near Hobbiton, and, and then moved um, into the Hokianga where I spent a number of years living off grid, so I know about these things. Um, I enjoy an active outdoor lifestyle, but basically I'm, I'm, I'm a mother first, uh, a wife, um, a geographer, a planner, and more latterly an academic at Otago University. Um, I'm now the director of something called the Centre for Sustainability. We do a lot of work with communities and um, particularly around energy issues. And in the last um, three years, I've been co-leading a project called the Energy Cultures Project, which I'll talk about a bit more later on today, possibly. New Zealand is a very tiny country in a very big ocean, so we're a long way from everywhere, and we're also very long and thin, which has real implications for transport and also electricity um, um, generation and, and transmission. We have a population of about 4.4 million, which means that there's not many of us in a very, very big space. Most of our electricity is generated through renewables, 77% last year, and we've had a reasonably long-running aspiration for 90% of renewable energy generation by 2025. But our current government actually has also very strong aspirations in developing fossil fuels offshore. So unsurprisingly, there's quite a lot of energy conflicts, offshore oil drilling, lignite mining. Um, many other areas are also being fought over, including fracking. But most recently, there's also been a lot of opposition to the sale of New Zealand's major in energy companies, at least partial sales to people. So a lot of um, discussion about that. Strange institutional split um, between the demand and supply side in government. So on the demand side, we have a very weak agency called the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority. On the supply side, it's seen importantly as economic development or more, more recently business innovation and employment is where energy sits. We've got a very strong also policy schizophrenia, not only in relation to fossil fuels, but between weak demand side policies and, and also policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It all just doesn't add up, and quite a lot of us are, are, are raising our eyebrows about that policy schizophrenia. <laughs> Initiatives on the demand side are, are not very many. Um, we use television advertising. Um, we use um, awards for energy efficient businesses, um, some energy star ratings on appliances, and subsidies for insulation and clean heat. And that's, there's not a lot more going on than that. C would know better than I. Interestingly, consumption has flattened in the last year, few years, partly to do with economic downturn in the industrial area, but also really um, flattening off in the residential area as well. And the rate of energy efficiency improvement is well below the OECD average. And really that's where our, our concern lies in the consumption area. New Zealand is quite odd because compared, get, compared to OECD countries, we've got very low household energy use per, per household. At the same time, we're fourth in the world in the number of cars we own. And unsurprisingly, our, our um, transport energy use as a percentage of total household energy is at the top end. We have very poor housing stock and houses have been measured as being colder than the inside of a fridge in their living room, so people tend to wrap up. Unsurprisingly, woolen underwear is very important in New Zealand, so much so that we've actually turned it into a sex symbol. <laughs> More context, um, mo mostly our water heating is through electricity, not gas. Um, there's been a real uptake in, in the use of, of um, heat pumps in New Zealand in recent years. And also um, smart meters are just starting to be rolled out by companies, but it's not required by government. This is something that is purely a, a, a business initiative. Behavioural models, I would say neoliberalism is the most powerful behavioural model in, <laughs> in the country. You don't take subsidies. Engineers are highly influential also in, in the way we perceive behaviour, and so are marketing and PR companies, um, which are employed by the government. The Energy Cultures um, Project has brought a bit of a more of a nuanced view, view of behaviour. Evaluating behaviour change outcomes, the government was looking at gigawatt savings and the value of energy savings and also the value of health savings as a, a, um, a way of measuring um, behaviour change or particularly demand side management, so looking at it in, in those terms. 
In 2011, they've changed their tune because they didn't really achieve those. So they've been looking at things like consumer energy intensity. Funnily enough, their aspirations are the same as business as usual. Number of houses insulated, again, that is happening anyway. And they want the minimum energy performance standards to be in line with major trading partners. Really no initiatives there either. Kind of business as usual. Researchers are looking at things like improvements in health as a result of improving the warmth of houses. Um, they're also looking at just practical things, engineering things like reduction in, in, um, in uh, moisture um, and R values and so forth. So people are out there measuring houses. Other researchers are looking at things like what happens when people have personalised energy advice. Do they do things? Do they not do them? Or they, do they intend to do them? In energy cultures, we're getting people to set personalised priorities and um, seeing what changes. And also we're looking at material culture, social norms and energy practices and how those are changing as a result of actions. So what I hope to see from this task, what's going on in internationally, obviously, how might you predict what kind of changes in behaviour might occur from demand-side management and how should we measure the effectiveness of our demand-side management tools. And finally, um, I, I'd just like to make a note of warning. Um, changing behaviour is really dangerous, so will those changes unleash unintended consequences? Or will we be able to achieve what we want to with the help of the forces of good? <laughs> Thank you.